So uh, you can generally, you know, whenever they ask a question like this, they generally won't be asking you between the competition between CT and MRI. They will be generally asking you which imaging modality is the uh, first line of diagnosis uh, or which imaging modality is used as a gold standard. Uh, options including conventional radiography, ultrasound, CT, and fluoroscopy, generally speaking. Okay, uh, so in such kind of a situation, you always, always go and choose a CT scan, but if specifically asked as a plain CT and contrast enhanced CT, you always choose, okay, contrast enhanced CT, okay? Even fluoroscopy, the barium studies can also be done in a CT way, okay? Uh, barium meal or barium swallow or barium edema have been given down into the patient, but still a CT scan can be taken. So you just say contrast enhanced CT. It can be both the iodinated contrast agents and it can also be both the, you know, uh, the double contrast studies as well as barium studies, plain barium studies, okay? So contrast enhanced CT is considered as the gold standard. Uh, in a general view, we can actually say it as CT as well, okay? But do not forget which one is much more superior. MRI is much more superior, but it is not considered as a gold standard yet because of its uh, limited disadvantages and application, okay? Application is all, most of the times it is cost effective, time consuming and patient related issues, okay? Not ac actually scientific issues related down to medicine, okay? Is this point clear? Is there any confusion? Yes, no? Okay, right. Now, you have to see here, it has got its own advantages and disadvantages inherent to its own particular technology, right? Well, generally, the choice of modality is frequently based on clinical condition, okay? Uh, for example, to say, uh, if a patient is generally coming up with, uh, you know, a complaint like uh, appendicitis, a, pay, a complaint like acute pancreatitis, or a suspected hepatocellular carcinoma, we generally, okay, what do you want to do? Is there, okay, what is the first instinctive feeling that you uh, get when I usually say uh, such kind of diseases? Okay, let us take a patient of appendicitis, acute appendicitis, Okay, what kind of imaging modality do? What, do you, what, what is the thing that actually comes down uh, based on the knowledge that you have acquired till today? Okay, what, will you do uh, go for an abdominal X-ray or will you go for an ultrasound, CT or MRI? Which one do you want to do? You may not be aware of the protocols, but still, uh, if I say I'm suspecting a case of acute appendicitis, okay, uh, which one do you think is going to provide you better information? Okay, see, okay. Uh, Dravendra, Archana, and other guys who has ever mentioned as ultrasound. Okay, could you tell me the reason why you actually chose down to write ultrasound for that particular patient? Is there any specific reason behind it? Or is it just uh, because I said it is the first line of the diagnosis? First line bedside diagnosis, okay, it is the first imaging thing that we do. That's the reason. Did you say it that way or is it because of some other reason? Shubangi, Rajwan, other guys, whoever wrote. See, for abdominal first line, uh, see, uh, when I was telling you that statement for abdominal first line, I'm not te technically talking about the appendix, right? I was talking about the exploration of the abdomen, right? In such kind of a view, yes, when you are when you do not know for forming a provisional diagnosis, okay, you don't know where your symptoms is, uh, you know, departing to which kind of organ, 
uh, in the abdomen, abdominal system, then that is the time where you actually use an ultrasound. I already told you which organ it belongs to. I told it already belongs to appendix. So it depends on the sensitivities and specificities of that pathological process of appendicitis, right? Okay, so now maybe my question became more clear. If I asked you, what will you do for a patient uh, with an abdominal pain, maybe ultrasound could have been a correct answer. Did you understand? But right now, I already specifically told you I have been suspecting a case of acute appendicitis. Right now, now again, answer the same question back. Okay, what kind of investigation do you usually want to prescribe? CT, see, now the answer is becoming more clear. And like I said, that whenever I am choosing up an imaging modality, the choice of imaging modality generally depends upon the presenting complaint if you can localize it or if you cannot localize it, first thing. And the second thing actually comes down is that, okay, even if you have localized it, okay, is the imaging modality sensitive enough for knowing about this particular pathology physiological process? Okay, but can you actually able to look at the evidence of the pathophysiology of that particular disease on this imaging modality that is technically called as sensitivity and specificity okay which you will be learning in uh, you know uh, general health medicine and statistics uh, uh, chapters so in relation to appendix yes ct is considered down as the gold standard okay yes uh, yeah, we can use both types of CT. Yes, uh, both contrast enhanced CT and plain CT. Yes, both of them are equally sensitive. Okay. And MRI is also as sensitive as CT. Okay. Yeah, of course. Of course, you see here, uh, generally, uh, the reason behind why we did not actually choose an MRI here is that MRI uh, appendicitis is such kind of a condition where it is an acute emergency, right? So in acute emergency situation, what is the imaging modality that we are going to choose? CT, that's your answer, okay? And other thing is that, okay, you also need to make some kind of a, you know, uh, observation. The most of the times, the diagnosis of acute appendicitis is dependent upon clinical criteria clinical symptoms, the patient presents up with lower abdominal pain, right iliac force of pain, along with the fever, uh, sorry, along with vomiting that is actually preceded with the fever. Uh, that is the one actually indicates that the patient is suffering from appendicitis. So most of the times the diagnosis is based upon, uh, you know, laboratory investigations and clinical presentation. So in such kind of a situation, you actually will be choosing then you, when you already know the diagnosis and when you when the condition is not actually, you know, an emergency situation. Yes, uh, we know uh, uh, that is the time where we, we actually have a choice. OK, if you require better information, yes, you will be going down for an MRI. But if you wanted to actually localize and see the severity of the condition, you will be going down for CT. Yes, Ravindra, yes, if we already know appendicitis, then why do we do CT? You see here, I think in basic anatomical classes, you must have already known that the appendix is some kind of an argon, which is does not have a standard anatomical orientation. It can be located down at six different locations, right? It can be pelvic, it can be retrocecal, okay? It can be angulated, okay? It can be having a different, different positions, okay? Have you learned about the positions of mm, appendix? So we know it is appendicitis, but we are making a CT scan to look at the position of the appendix, one thing. The second thing, we are going to look at the complications if that has been perforated, okay? And third thing, we are going to look at if there are any kind of stones. Okay, appendicitis associated with appendicolitis. So we just wanted to confirm those are all things. Okay, so it is actually providing us the information about how to treat this person. 
okay generally speaking okay uh, since we haven't come down into pathological sessions yet uh, i will teach about appendicitis yet but let me give you a very brief idea how it happens let us say if an appendix patient appendicitis patient generally has only a vomiting okay you can call it as you know primary grade appendicitis okay there is you can in such kind of a situation generally you can actually go with the medical management but let us say the patient has developed a fever over time maybe in the next 12 hours the patient has already developed a little fever so what happens is that i will actually try to include the antibiotics with it and still want to put the patient in the inpatient itself i do not want it to go for appendectomy but right now if the, still the patient is not responding over the time of 24 hours to 48 hours what i usually do is that i will plan for surgery so that is how i am actually making up the protocol based on the each observation i make okay so during that first 24 hours to 48 hours what i generally will be doing is that i will not go for a ct i will be generally going down for a bedside ultrasound but if i am planning for certain surgery and if i wanted to sure make myself sure about the complete anatomical information and complete pathophysiological condition Yes, I will be going down for a contrast enhanced CT and then plan for the surgery. Did you understand? So it is actually depends on, you know, the complete sensitivity and specificity of an imaging modality related down to a particular condition. So that's the reason I have been telling yesterday that you have to form a particular provisional diagnosis based on the presenting symptoms and patterns for the patient but not choose an imaging modality and then look for the basic lesions no it is highly impossible now let me give you to avoid more confusion give you another case clinical scenario let us say if i have been observing if i have been suspecting a patient of suspected intestinal obstruction which one do you think is going to help me with this I have a patient with sudden abdominal bloating and I uh, usually am suspecting down a small bowel obstruction. So what is the imaging modality do you think that will help me to diagnose such kind of a situation? By the x-ray, see, right now you got the answer right away, x-ray. Yes, x-ray has got equal sensitivity in related down to CT as well, right? Because both of them are x-rays. One is providing down you a 2D image without slicer sections, which is called as a scalp film. Whereas we will be looking down at the same, almost the same kind of radiographic features uh, down on CT as well, right? So CT and X-ray has both of them has got equal sensitivity in recognizing the small bowel obstruction, yes or no? So you have an open choice there, okay? Either you think that you can go for CT or either you can go for an X-ray, okay? Did you get it now? Did you understand what exactly uh, how a doctor is analyzing which modality to choose when he is writing down a prescription? Yes or no? As physicians, you should be aware of these protocols. OK, we will be dealing with one and small protocols whenever we are coming down to pathology sessions. OK, so now that is what uh, the situation based on the frequent, uh, based on the clinical condition of the patient and based on the sensitivity and specificity statistics of a imaging modality a doctor is liable to choose the imaging investigation which has to be done in this patient okay that's rule right now never ever ignore history and physical examination which actually plays a very essential part for evaluating abnorm abdominal abnormalities okay always always history and physical examination plays a very important part even before you start an investigation but in other conditions let us say i just need one evidence something like cardiothoracic system okay i say that okay i have a retrosternal chest pain i have been having angina pectoris okay i don't need anything else okay just write down the ecg with no matter now you need even you ask you don't ask about the history of hypertension or anything 
nothing matters. Okay, you just write down the ECG right away because you can be able to find out the evidences on the ECG itself. Okay, I say I have a cuff. Okay, I say I have a productive cuff for the last 15 days. Yeah, go write down an X-ray or a CT scan, uh, depending on your ideology, and then you know you will be ab obviously getting because I was not expecting any kind of a disease there. I just wanted to know. Okay, there is a symptom that is actually indicating this investigation, so I write it down. But here it is highly impossible that way. Okay, if I say. I have been okay. Let us take a clinical scenario and let us try to understand this one. Okay, a uh, you know a 65 year old male presents up to the hospital with a complaint of a sudden abdominal pain and bloating. Okay, sudden abdominal pain and bloating, and has fever for the last. Uh, you know, 12 hours, high grade fever for the last 12 hours. On physical examination, you came to understand that the patient has ab absent abdominal bowel sounds. Okay. And then he has a history of, uh, you know, undergoing an, uh, you know, cholecystectomy uh, like eight years ago. And the patient is a known uh, person of uh, history of uh, diabetes mellitus and uh, congestive heart failure. Okay, this is the history. Let me repeat the history once again. A patient, a male of 65 year old male comes down to emergency clinic with a complaint of sudden abdominal pain aggravating with bloating. Okay, on physical examination, you came to understand that the patient did not have any bowel sounds. He is a known case of hypertension and congestive heart failure, has undergone cholecystectomy for six years. Okay, uh, six years ago. And he has a high grade fever for the last 12 hours. So, this is a history. Now, what is this? telling you what is this history suggesting you is there anything that should suggest you this one okay what is the diagnosis that might be coming down uh, first in your brain what are you thinking it, it is difficult i know you see this is a very peculiar case i have been talking about but uh, but but you, you think first what is that actually that might come down into your brain Just if you can understand the history a little bit well, yeah, you can actually make down the diagnosis here. Even if we did not make down the diagnosis also, yeah, we can actually make out some pathophysiological process. Yes, somebody tell me what exactly, what is the disease that you are going to think about here? Uh, what is OP? Outpatient? Okay, somebody is thinking about irritable bowel syndrome. Benedict, what is OP? Is it outpatient or post-operative? Which one are you talking about? Surgery, right? So you're talking about post-operative, okay? So, Benedict, yes, exactly, you are correct. We are thinking about post-op complications. That is one, that is for sure, okay? We, because we have a history of previous abdominal surgery, right? Right now, you, but post-surgery complications is technically never called as a disease, right? I have never heard about a disease name which is called as post-surgery complications. So what kind of a disease or a disorder are you looking here for? Why Dravendra, Nitesh, and other guys uh, are not able to tell out the answer? Okay, Shafiq, uh, intestinal paralysis, you are talking about ileus. Wow, that's a very, very perfect answer. Yes, it is abdominal ileus. 
it is paralytic ileus, right? Okay, that is the correct answer. You are looking for intestinal paralysis, ileus. Okay, why Shafiq, why were you able to make down such kind of a very, very typical, you know, uh, you know, uh, diagnosis? The history actually didn't, was not suggesting anything that way, but what actually made you think that disease? Absence of bubble sounds. Perfect. You see here, the only one single observation of a single, you know, uh, physical examination thing, absence of bubble sounds, obviously he's making down the diagnosis of intestinal paralysis. And what is the risk factor behind it? Yes, Dr. Benedict has told it already. It is the post-surgery complications. So both of the doctors did a very good job in diagnosing this patient and actually forwarding them down to an imaging modality. Did you understand here? Okay, do not feel sorry or do not feel bad if other doctors were not able to make down this diagnosis, obviously. So right now, by these mistakes made by the other doctors, we come to understand from Dr. Shafiq and Dr. Benedict that yes, history and physical examination usually and always plays a very, very important role in making out a provisional diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Did you understand now? But when I said cough in respiratory system, yes, okay, there are millions of diseases. Okay, you will be, if there is a cough, you will be generally looking at the opacities present down in the middle and lower lobes. But here, when I said a dynamic ileus, okay, when I was talking about paralytic ileus, absence bubble sounds, I don't know where I'm looking at. I don't know the reason, okay? But I just know the diagnosis. So that for that exploration, I am actually going down for a CT. Did you understand this one? Is everybody clear with the diagnosis here? Yes or no? Right? Don't worry, you did not make down the diagnosis. That's fine. I know it is beyond your control at this level. But still, you have to understand and you have to look down it uh, for the history and physical examination. Okay, this, this uh, mistake has to teach us that we should never ignore the history and physical examination. Okay, so whenever you are following up the pathology of the uh, abdominal system, do not learn about, uh, sorry, do not forget to learn about, you know, uh, the history findings and the physical examination findings and laboratory investigating findings. A lot of clinical correlation is necessary because unless you make a provisional diagnosis, you are not going to move forward for observation of abdominal imaging, okay? Because they will not only suggest a cause, but it also helps to determine in which and imaging study will provide the best yielding correct diagnosis. Right now, Dr. Shafiq and Dr. Benedict tell me what kind of imaging modality is going to provide me this best information related down to paralytic ileus. Okay, you have an open choice here. Okay, what kind of investigation do you want to write for this patient when you are suspecting down a paralytic ileus? Okay, paralytic ileus is the inability of the abdomen or the inability of the intestines to actually make the peristaltic movements. Okay, so which one would be better? Contrast CT, no. It is not contrast CT, X-ray. We call it as X-ray series, fluoroscopy, X-ray series. Okay, X-ray series, we actually make X-ray series for monitoring purpose because it has got a higher risk in giving down intestinal obstructions. Okay, because unless we know about the pathophysiological process, we are not able to move forward. So how we actually learn about this pathophysiological process is that when we have a better anatomical information. So let's now go and explore the anatomical information in related to computer tomography, okay. The first thing we are going to start up with is liver. Remember, this chapter is going to be a little confusing. It is a very short chapter, but still very confusing. 
okay so i want you to pay conscious uh, pay attention here because we are going to learn a lot of theories that is going to help us later on okay right the first thing that we are going to observe in a computer tomographic image is that we are going to start along with the outlet thoracic outlet right so just below the diaphragm. So what is just below the diaphragm? Just below the diaphragm on the left side, we have stomach. On the right side, we've got the liver, right? Liver actually belongs down to, uh, you know, even if it belongs to gastrointestinal system, but generally in the modern times, we actually divide it down as a separate system, which is called as the hepatobiliary system, okay? So right now we are dealing with hepatobiliary system first, right? Hepatobiliary system, actually, liver is the first organ. We have got three different organs, okay? Here, one, we have got the liver. The second, we got the gallbladder. Third, we got the pancreas, okay? Which three of these structures are related down to the digestion, okay? Pancreas, liver, and gallbladder are the three organs that are related related to you know digestive processes but there is another soft tissue that is also present also there are another two soft tissues that are also present down uh in the abdominal cavity what are they any guesses don't guess you should tell me correct answer what are other structures that are present down in abdomen Spleen, you're looking only at spleen. Are there any other structures other than spleen? Kidneys, renal system, right? Okay, are only spleen and kidneys are the only structures that are still present? No, GIT is there. Okay, we are talking about GIT and hepatobiliary system are aided for digestion. In particular, if I'm talking about gastrointestinal tract, yes, I will be talking about only these organs in particular. But kidneys are entirely different. Reproductive systems, you see here, okay, because you cannot ignore the reproductive system as well, right? Okay, if it is a male, you will be having a uterus and ovaries. If it is a, uh, sorry, if it is a female, you will be having ovaries and uterus. But if it is a male, what do you have there? What do you have in abdomen? Okay, in the pelvic region, yes, we have posh, prostrate. But don't tell me you will be finding out the testis and the scrotal sac in the abdomen. Spermatic cord, okay? Don't ever make such kind of, come on, Jabalina, that's what I have been telling you. In abdomen, in abdomen, until its collimation, you are not going to find out the testis. The testis belongs to pelvic region, yes or no? That's what I have been telling. If you are looking at the abdomen, you are not going to look at the testis unless it is a baby. Yes or no? Okay. Adrenal glands, kidneys, spleen, and reproductive structures are the ones that are present down in the abdomen, which has got nothing relation to do with, you know, this gastrointestinal tract. Yes or no? So do not ignore so right now we are particularly dealing only with the digestive system. Okay, we will be dealing them as urogenital system as a separate chapter. Okay, that is a separate uh, complete orientation of the urogenital systems, which is entirely different from gastrointestinal tract. We'll be doing that normal anatomy and of them in a separate session. We don't have, we are not going to deal with spleen and kidneys in this session particularly. Okay, right now, then, you see here, the first thing is the liver. You have to understand that the liver is a very, very important organ in our body. It actually receives its blood supply from the hepatic arteries and the portal veins and the draining system, okay? Portal venal drainage. We call it as portal venal drainage, okay? The liver receives its blood mainly from the portal vein. Remember, okay? Remember. I think whatever you have learned in an anatomy, I think maybe it is completely contradicting today. When we were asking about the blood supply, you will always be talking about the arteries in particular, right? Maybe in basic anatomical sessions. But remember a basic fact that the liver 
gets its main blood supply from the portal vein, which is 80, almost 80%, 80 and 20% from the hepatic artery. Okay, do not forget this fact. Okay, the blood supply to the liver is done by the portal vein maximum and only minimum 20% or sometimes less than 20% is done by the hepatic artery. Okay, is this point clear? Did you know about this fact before or you don't know? Yes or no? You know about this fact, okay, right. So it is, I, I think, yes, most of the times, so some people actually, they think that, okay, when I was asking about the blood supply, they will generally answer it as the artery, but do not do that. In liver, actually it is supplied, 80% is supplied by the portal vein and 20% is supplied by the hepatic artery. But it will start to enhance down in the portal venous space. Okay, I will not be talking about this one right now, but I will talk about after some time. But just remember it, enhancement is done. Enhancement of the liver is much more seen in the portal venous space, okay? Right. Now, for practical purposes, everyone has to be aware of the vascular distribution and the liver actually defines its own anatomy. And since the vascular anatomy is the one that actually redirects uh, a doctor for this surgical approach to the liver lesions. Okay, right? You have to understand the branches, branchial distribution of the hepatobiliary, uh, you know, blood vessels. Unless we do not know about that one, we will not be able to design a surgical procedure when we are dealing up with a condition related down to liver lesions. For example, to say I wanted to resect out a case of uh, abdominal, uh, sorry, uh, liver abscess, hepatic abscess, or sometimes I'm going to re resect a session of hydatid cyst disease, or when I'm trying to look down at the patient with, uh, you know, uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, or when I'm trying to look at a condition called as cavernous hemangioma, okay, I should be always, always make myself sure about the anatomical distribution of the blood vessels. I'm going to look at the vascular distribution of the hepatic and portal veins. Unless I do that, I will not be able to do, uh, you know, uh, perform the correct surgery, where to dissect and what to dissect. Do you understand? So first we will be learning about that particular things here. To understand the different orientation, okay, to understand the perfect orientation of the liver distributions, what we generally usually do is to look at a classification of the segments of the liver. Okay, remember, okay. Same way how we have divided down the lung as different pulmonary segments, we also divide the liver down into different segments. Okay, and such kind of, uh, you know, uh, classification is actually called as Conrad Conard classification of liver segments. Okay, did you learn this one in anatomy? Yes, no. We divide down the liver into different segments depending upon the vasculature, okay? So that classification is actually called as Conrad classification of liver segments, okay? This one is not Conard Ranchian, okay? Conard classification of liver segments, okay? He's a surgeon who has made this classification. Have you ever heard of this classification? Did you learn this one before? If you have learned, I will not get down into the details. I will just get down into the overview. But if you haven't learned, okay, let me tell the complete detail. Okay, please respond. Have you learned about this? No? Okay, you haven't learned about this. Okay, fine. Okay, see, remember right now, what actually is that you know that the liver is divided down into two lobes, right? Right and left lobe and chordate lobes, okay? 
generally we call it as the bigger part is the caudate lobe okay and it is divided down into the bigger right lobe and the you know shorter left lobe yes or no liver has got two lobes it has got the right and the left lobe okay and which one again there is a one kind of a lobe which is actually also present down on the posterior side which we actually call it as caudate lobe okay we can either answer it as a two or either we can answer it as three okay standard way of telling is actually three uh, lobes of the liver okay what are the lobes of liver we have got the right lobe of the liver which is anterior left lobe of the liver which is completely lateral and caudate lobe of the liver which is completely posterior okay yes do you know this one yes or no is this clear until now okay now each one of these lobes is actually subdivided down into two segments okay each one of this lobe is divided completely down into two segments and which actually are the anterior segments and the posterior segments okay and the left lobe is subdivided down into two segments which one is the medial segment and the lateral segment remember the right lobe is divided down into two segments anterior and posterior the left lobe of the liver is divided down into two segments the medial and the lateral okay is this clear until now right lobe into anterior and posterior and then it is subdivided down into the left lobe is subdivided down into two segments the medial and the lateral right now look at this image this is the classification so here i cannot actually see uh, number one yet okay number one is actually like i said it is the uh, posterior one which is nothing but your caudate lobe remember segment one is your caudate lobe you can also call the, it as a segment or you can also call it as a lobe because it is big okay it is as big as to define the criteria of a lobe so generally uh, same like the lingular segment or you can also call as the lingular lobe in the lung okay that's the same way here we call it as either caudate lobe or the caudate segment okay so number one segment is called as the caudate lobe okay then we have got another the number four you see here four has got two things which is a part of which is a part of you know uh, the left lung which has got two parts in it which we actually call it as a quadrate lobe okay it has got four parts in it anterior and posterior okay so which one is got the four a four b okay which is divided down itself into another anterior and posterior it belongs down to the right lobe of the uh, you know liver so number one is actually called as the caudate lobe number four is actually called as the quadrate lobe okay quadrate lobe okay caudate caudate is number one okay quadrate is number four okay okay so that way now the left lobe of the liver is divided down into two segments which is actually mentioned down as two and three okay two and three remember two and three are the segments we don't have any names for them okay we just have we just call it as segments okay we call it by numbers itself not something like the anterior posterior uh, segments what we call them as different names uh, in the uh, lung we do not have any particular names here okay there is another terminology also but most commonly used one is the numbers okay number one and then we have got the uh, number one is the caudate lobe number four is the quadrate lobe and then we have got segment number two which is superior okay and lateral 
and then we have got the third segment which is actually again lateral and anterior okay then we have uh, and here you see here they will be going down in an inverted clockwise anti-clockwise direction okay number five number six number seven and number eight so by this figure you can actually understand which is the most superior segment number seven is the most superior segment yes or no did you understand is, is it being clear now okay which is the most superiorly oriented number seven okay which one is the most inferiorly uh, located it is number six okay which one actually forms the floor it is actually the five one and four b okay which one is actually forming down the complete lateral segments number two and number three so we got eight liver segments there are no names for them technically you just have to remember them as numbers okay now you have got you have to understand i have been telling up this classification is directly related down uh, to your blood supply right remember here one thing that the caudate lobe then segment number one has got a direct communication with the inferior vena cava see here this is the inferior vena cava we are looking at and this has got a direct blood supply caudate lobe has got a direct blood supply with the inferior vena cava okay right then actually here in the base of the liver we have got another area which is actually called as the hepatorenal recess or the subphrenic recess okay and they are the one that actually forms down a condition uh, forms down a structure called as the ligamentum arteriosum okay ligamentum teres or so we call it as okay and ligamentum teres and ligamentum arteriosum is the one that we have here okay so that is the one it actually the, the one that is the one actually divides down the right lobe and the left lobe okay and after that this is the portal vein and portal veins got has its lateral branches supplying down to the sixth segment and the seventh segment and the right branch actually sorry the left branch actually supplies down to the segment number two and number segment number three then inferior uh, vena cava superior branches actually supplies the blood supply to the segment number seven segment number eight and segment number four okay you understand this one right now that is how the segmental classification is based upon it is dependent upon the vascular classification okay vascular distribution inferior vena cava just you have to uh, for examination purpose you have to remember one thing here inferior vena cava has got a direct blood supply to the caudate lobe okay that is the only thing you remember here others you need not worry and other the next thing you have to remember here is about okay what is the blood supply the maximum blood supply of the liver is done by portal vein 80 percent is done by portal vein and 20 percent is done by okay hepatic artery okay this is the segmental classification remember the positions here okay one two three and then come down to 4a and 4b then 5 6 and then 7 8 okay you are going down in anti-clockwise direction so 5 6 7 8 1 2 3 4 4 a 4 b okay that is you see here maybe you can remember how to divide this one in a very simple way when it is coming down to the right uh, sorry left side or more laterally uh, sorry more medially because this one is coming down more medially caudate lobe is present more medial and then you rotate it clockwise direction when you rotate it in the clockwise direction okay one two and three and then four right but when it is coming down onto the right side you are rotating it in an anti-clockwise direction okay so five six seven eight so that is why how how it is okay clockwise and anti-clockwise directions okay that is a uh, uh, simple uh, way how you can actually remember the segments is this clear segmental classification okay
Yes or no, guys? Right? Do not uh, forget this one, this kind of classification. It is very important uh, later on, not now exactly. Okay. Now we have got a prominent fat filled fissure that contains two things which actually is the falciform ligament and the ligament and teres, which is actually a remnant of the umbilical vein okay which actually separates the medial and lateral okay medial and lateral segments of the left lobe of the liver okay medial and lateral segments okay this one is the medial and and the lateral segments this is the one is actually dividing okay ligamentum teres Okay, we actually, I think uh, in this view, we are actually looking down at the ligamentum teres much more specifically here. Okay, this one that actually divides down the falciform ligament and the ligamentum teres is actually a remnant of the umbilical vein in the fetal life. Okay, later on, this one completely closes. Okay, later on, this one completely closes and then they become down a fat filled fissure. Okay. So, which is actually called as the falciform ligament or the ligamentum teres. Okay. It is a remnant of the umbilical vein. Just remember it that way. Uh, I think that information is more than enough because I will not get down into fetal circulation and its relations yet because you haven't completed down pediatrics and gynecology uh, obstetrics yet. So, uh, we will not get into that particular details, but still remember it is a remnant of an umbilical vein. Okay, and it is the one that actually separates the medial and lateral segments of the left lobe of the liver. Okay, now you see here, this is a cross sectional imaging of uh, the uh, liver. Now, first, we actually have to find out the ligamentum teres is the one that is actually dividing down the medial and lateral segments of the left lobe of the liver, right? So M is the left lobe of the liver. So which segment this could be? Tell me, guys. Which segment could this be? What is the left lobe of the liver has got? It has got medial and lateral, right? It has got two segments, right? Medial and lateral. Okay, what this segment could be? M. Which segment could it be? Right, exactly. So you are looking at the segments of number two and three. For example, to say if I look at a lesion here, okay, I'm going to write, okay, I'm going to look at, I'm, I'm looking at a hyperdensity or a hypodensity that is present along this segment number two or three. Do you remember, right? Okay, for example, to say if it is present down here, I'm going to write number two, and if it's present here, I'm going to write number three. Simple, right? Okay. Yes or no? Two and three, uh, but depending on the levels, okay, one is superior, other is inferior, right? Okay, one is superior, other is inferior. Since I'm looking at this one, I'm looking at segment number two, right? What is superior? Okay, I'm looking at more superior areas only. I still did not go down to the inferior area. Okay, so I'm looking at the segment number two. So they, did you understand why we are exactly uh, trying to utilize and here is the caudate lobe okay here is the caudate lobe and here is the quadrate lobe and here we have got other five six and seven okay eight uh, sorry seven we did not see we have got only five six here okay but eight and seven are present much more higher right so we will be looking at much more higher level uh, I will be, you know, when we are completely looking at the complete abdominal uh, CT sections levels, I will be dealing about the segments there are again once in detail. But right now, you have to just remember here, recognizing the ligamentum teres. Ligamentum teres actually shows up as, <clears throat> as a hypodensity, okay? Ligamentum teres shows up as a hypodensity, which will obviously be present between the medial lobe and the lateral lobe of the uh, lateral segments of the left lobe of the liver okay right and r here is the one that is actually representing the right lobe of the liver which is technically divided down into the caudate lobe okay caudate is the one that is present here okay and the area you see here there is a small area here 
the small area, which is actually hypodense area, which is actually the space in the retroperitoneum, which is actually called as the Morrison spot. Okay, remember, this small density that is actually present down here is actually called as the Morrison spot. This is not pouch of Douglas. Okay, pouch of Douglas is the one that is present down in the inferior abdomen. Okay, but on the superior abdominal contents, okay, uh, in the superior abdominal regions, what we actually see is that there is a faint gap that is present between the inferior vena cava and the caudate lobe of the liver. Okay, there is a faint space that is present down here, which we actually call it as the Morrison's pouch. Get it? Did you heard this name before? Have you heard this one? It is called as Morrison's Morrison's pouch. Okay. Okay, remember Morrison's pouch is a very faint area that is present between the inferior vena cava and the caudate lobe of the liver. Okay, I will talk about when we are dealing about the pathologies, we will talk about this one there. But remember, this is the area that one. IVC is the inferior vena cava we are looking at. And you, your A is the iota. See, descending iota, or you can also call it as the abdominal iota. And immediately, just immediately anterior to it, you are going to look down at two structures that are actually bifurcating. Okay? First, recognize the iota. I think you do not have a problem whenever uh, recognizing the iota. This is a plain CT, guys. Okay? This is not contrast enhanced yet because I am not looking at the blood vessels as hyperdensities yet. So this is a plain CT. And I'm looking here almost in the midline almost in the midline running posteriorly is the one a circular hypodensity uh, circular homogeneous hyperdensity that i'm looking at here is the iota okay immediately anterior to the iota i will be looking at two bifurcations here that one are the two this one is the hepatic artery and this one is the splenic artery get it okay First, recognize the abdominal iota, and then immediately I'm looking anterior to it as the two branches, okay, two branches immediately taking down from them. They are the hepatic artery and the pancreatic and splenic arteries. You see here, this one is going down to the spleen, and S is the spleen. So if you recognize the spleen, you move along with that direction and you will be finding out a, a streak-like hyperdensity, which is actually your hep, uh, splenic artery. Okay, and then on the right side, it is dividing down as the hepatic artery. And in the middle, it is dividing down as the pancreatic artery. Okay, here P is the pancreas. Okay, and then it is dividing down and going posteriorly as the splenic artery. Okay, this is the branch distribution. First, recognize the iota, and then you recognize the hepatic, pancreatic, and the splenic artery. Then we have got a homogeneous hyperdensity that is present down in the posterior side of the abdomen on the left side, which is recognized as spleen. Okay, remember the spleen. Spleen is a homogeneous density. The density of the spleen is a little less than liver. Okay. Remember the Hounsfield units. Okay, the, what is the soft tissue density? Soft tissue density. What is the soft tissue density? Hounsfield units. What is the how much the value? What is the value of soft tissue density? Hundred range. Hundred to two hundred. Four hundred to five hundred. Okay, it's not, it is 10 to 100, correct, it is 10 to 100. Okay, below 10, 0 to 10 is called as the fluid density and 10 to uh, 100 is actually called as the soft tissue density, right? Okay, now you have to remember the soft tissue density of the liver is a little bit higher than that of the spleen, okay? So that is normal, that is normal. You understand here? Okay. And the next one you see here, once you recognize these structures, okay, the P is the pancreas, 
the pancreas is present down in the antiperitoneum okay antiperitoneum and here it is a soft tissue density which is actually showing up as a leaf like structure which has got three parts in it it has got the body head and the tail okay we will dealing about the pancreas also okay slowly but remember it this p is a leaf like structure the pancreas which is present anterior to the splenic artery okay now on the posterior side immediately to the hepatic artery we have got a oval density okay or an helicloid density which is actually the portal vein that you can actually see it entering down into the liver okay so immediately after you place this you know immediately after you place this hepatic artery just immediately posterior to it is the presence of an helicloid hyperdensity that is called as the portal vein okay and immediately posterior to the portal vein you have got the inferior vena cava so portal vein inferior vena cava and the hepatic artery are uh, sorry uh, you can say portal vein hepatic artery and the common bile duct is the one that is actually forming the portal triad okay portal triad did you, did you hear this name before portal triad portal triad did you hear this name before yes okay what are the components of the portal triad you have got the portal vein hepatic artery and the bile ducts this is the one that actually forms the portal triad right so do not forget this do not forget about this typical classification here always always remember the positions of them bile duct is much more anterior in the middle you have got the hepatic artery and in the posterior side you have got the portal vein and this distribution is the first step here okay this is the first branch here and it actually forms and goes down with the same branches even down in the peripheries and also when forming down the smaller bile ducts as well okay each lobule okay what are the cells of uh, you know <clears throat> what are the what are the you know components of the liver tissue called as when you actually make down a cross section of the liver you actually find out hexagonal cells don't we okay and in between each hexagonal cells you will be actually looking down at a portal triad yes or no do you remember that one yes or no right that's the same thing happens okay the same distribution happens all over even at the microscopic level also so do not forget the contents of the portal triad okay portal vein hepatic artery and the bile duct okay but here the main one is actually we are talking about is the main branch of the portal vein okay biggest diameter of the portal vein biggest diameter of the hepatic artery and biggest diameter has got the common bile duct so this one from here the individual branching actually starts and distributing all over the liver okay so do not forget that this is a very very important uh, point to be noted here okay then we have got uh the intestines and stomach on the right side okay and you see here immediately when i recognize the pancreas okay from the pancreas we got the pancreatic duct okay pancreatic duct actually opens down into where is the pancreatic duct draining into Where is the pancreatic drug draining into duodenum? Okay, could you be more specific? Is it the first part of the duodenum or the second part of the duodenum? Second part of the duodenum, right? So right now, once you recognize the pancreas, you look immediately lateral to it. This is the duodenum. Did you understand how I'm re recognizing the structure? So from here, the pancreatic duct directly opening down into the duodenum. So when I can look at the full length of the pancreas, which means to say I'm looking at the second part of the duodenum at the same level as well. Did you get it? Now, did you understand how we are actually are trying to observe the uh, one relation with another relation? First, to start to observe the structure that you can commonly find and then go down along with their anatomical locations. 
okay unless your anatomy is clear you are not going to understand ct anymore okay i have been repeating this more over and over in every chapter it will get more and more difficult in central nervous system central nervous system has got the complex anatomy and you will be you know you will feel a lot of difficulty there right now okay you see here whenever i see the full length of the pancreas i will be looking at the second part of the duodenum okay so immediately after the duodenum okay what actually is the structure that i am looking at i am looking at as the jejunum and the small intestine right so which means to say above that level above that level will be my stomach and the gastric uh, iso uh, sorry the pyloric sphincter okay we will, i will have the gastric antrum above this level and i will be having intestines below this level is this quite clear and this is not the level where the kidneys usually start yes or no so remember this level this is actually superior abdominal level where i will be following up the structures this slice is a very very important slice where you have to recognize all these structures let me recall once again and then we will have a break the first thing i'm going to do is that i'm going to look at the iota iota is almost present down in the center and as a well defined circular density okay and immediately after i recognize the abdominal iota anterior to it i will be seeing along the bifurcation which is actually showing up me the hepatic artery on the right side pancreatic artery on the midway and the splenic artery going down to the posterior side okay then immediately anterior to it i can see a leaf like hyperdensity soft tissue structure which is actually the pancreas and lateral to the pancreas there is the second part of the duodenum okay and then lateral to the hepatic artery i have got the ligamentum teres okay ligamentum teres is the one that actually divides down the medial and lateral segments of the left lobe of the liver immediately posterior to the hepatic artery i have got an oval shaped ellipsoid density which is actually the portal vein and immediately to the portal posterior to the portal vein i will be looking at a much more lower density than the portal vein which will actually is the inferior vena cava inferior vena cava immediately posterior to the inferior vena cava i will be seeing out a faint hypodense area which is actually correlating has got its borders with the right side uh, with the medial border of the liver of the caudate segment okay and to the medial border of the sorry the lateral border of the vertebra which is actually a faint area called as the morrison's pouch the right lobe of the liver has got the posterior segment which is called as the caudate lobe right now and immediately on the right side we have got the caudate lobe and on the left side we have got a homogeneous density okay which is the spleen the density of the spleen is a little bit lower than the liver we are done with it we 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 came to recognize almost all the structures now somebody tell me what are these two structures i'm looking at here if you have listened to your class yesterday i think you can answer this answer yeah that is muscle which muscles now no okay do one thing find out the muscles of the abdomen Lattice must dorsi. Okay, if there is a debate between psoas major and lattice must dorsi, find out the abdominal muscles. That's the homework for you guys. Okay. Right. Trapezius. I think trapezius is present down. Okay, fine. We have got three different answers. I don't want to answer that question there. okay i want you guys to find out what is the structure there and also find out which number vertebrae is this one
okay you have got two tasks if you have followed down the yesterday abdominal regional divisions or the quadrilateral divisions yes you can technically answer this question which vertebrae can somebody take a guess which vertebrae lumbar vertebrae so which actually you see here which actually you did not even remember your respiratory system that is not lumbar vertebrae that is the thoracic vertebrae indeed i can still see a structure that is coming out of this vertebral process what is the you see here see i told you you guys find out that muscle name and tell me later on don't tell me like you know uh, so many muscle names somebody was telling lattice mus okay erector spinae quadratus lumborum trapezius psoas major psoas minor okay no you guys find out and you tell me one confirmed answer okay <clears throat> right see this one i am actually looking down at the thoracic vertebrae indeed the thoracic vertebrae has got almost down you know is a circular density but the lumbar vertebrae has got the rectangular vertebral bodies don't you remember that yes okay we will be dealing about, about again that recognizing the ribs and the vertebrae later on again in the musculoskeletal system but don't not confuse this is the 12th rib and that is the where we actually made down a division right dividing down into the superior hypochondrium and the lumbar regions okay that is isn't that the where we draw a line yesterday did you remember that one we drew a line along the 12th thoracic vertebrae right yes yes no guys do you remember that one when we are trying to make down the regional divisions yes we made a line there right so that's what it is that is that this level okay so do not forget about this anatomical structures here okay this is a, a lot of questions can be asked down from here okay now i, I think uh, i have almost done here uh spleen also i have done completely uh i think we will have a break and then we'll meet up in uh it is 11 30 now and we will meet up around 11 45. uh what is the structure on that image which has the same density as the bone clara let me check which one are you talking about? This one? This one? You mean yes, right? Yes, Clara? Isn't this one you are talking about? Okay. Yeah, we will. I, I will tell you that one, okay? I, I will deal when we are going down into much more bigger slices, okay? That is actually the feces, okay? Undigested, partially digested food that has been present down, okay? It is not a bone, it is feces. It's a food content. All right. Okay, let's have a break. Uh, we will meet at 11.45. Right. Okay. So the next uh, structure uh, we are going to look at is the spleen, uh, which I have already, uh, you know, uh, talked about. Uh, but uh, we will generally now look down into you know uh, two different uh, conditions okay the first thing actually you uh, see here you have to understand one thing on a non-enhanced ct or a non-contrast ct okay or a plain ct okay three of them stays the same name okay it is a plain ct non-enhanced ct okay right we have got the liver should be always of higher density or equal density in relation to the spleen density okay on non contrast scans or non enhancing scans or plain ct on a plain ct the liver should be of higher density than that of a spleen so spleen should be lower or spleen should be uh, sorry spleen should be lower and the liver should be higher okay or they can be of equal density now why do we actually use this fact uh why actually uh, 
testing looking about the hyperdensities and the hypodensities or the density distributions and in comparison between the liver and the spleen. Let me give you a radiographic condition, okay? Let me give you a radiographic condition and uh, try to uh, understand what exactly is, if it is uh, a different, uh, uh, we, we will try to observe uh, the, you know, what is the clinical uh, relation between that one. Now, if I see a patient with a density of the liver that is less than the spleen, okay? I, in a patient, if I see a density that is less than the spleen, okay? Uh, can you take a guess and tell me what could be that kind of clinical condition? Okay, if there is a density of the spleen that is less than, uh, sorry, if the density of the liver is less than the density of the spleen, then what kind of uh, uh, what kind of a clinical condition we might be looking at? <clears throat> okay, okay, nice answers. Yes. Uh, Look at this image I have just sent you. Okay, look at this image. Okay, look at this image and uh, uh, tell me, you see here on the right side, you can actually see in the image. Okay. See here, in this image, actually you see here, the structure I can find here is the iota, okay? So iota is completely, completely uh, hypodense. Uh, by this, actually, I can understand that I am looking at a, con uh, at a plain CT as well, okay? So now when, com when I recognize the iota, actually I am doing, okay, I'm looking at a soft tissue homogeneous density on the left side, which is actually the spleen. When compared to the density of the spleen, I'm looking at a specific density, which is much more lower in the liver, in the caudate lobe of the liver, okay? You see here, in the caudate lobe of the liver, I am actually looking at a very, very less density when it is compared down to the splenic density. Yes or no? So what could it be happening? Yes, we have got all the best answers, all the possible best answers. Uh, you see here, uh, except for hepatomegaly, hepatomegaly is generally, you know, increase in the size of the liver. Uh, increase in the size of the liver can also happen even without having fatty changes, okay? But still, yes, there is hepatomegaly in this condition. Yeah, uh, in this image you are looking at, that is true. But uh, the general, uh, you know, most common presentation where the density of the liver is less than the density of the spleen is actually hepatosteatosis. Okay, hepatosteatosis. Hepatosteatosis, which is actually nothing but your condition called as the fatty liver. Okay, so fatty liver changes generally can be happening because of uh, conditions like uh, hepatocellular carcinomas, or it can be happening like uh, cirrhosis. Okay, generally any kind of a patient being advanced with the alcoholic hepatitis will eventually form the fatty liver changes first, then the cirrhotic changes, and then the carcinomal changes later on. So uh, when you understand the pathophysiology of the hepatocellular carcinoma, Cirrhosis is, uh, sorry, fatty liver is the first change, and then it is actually going down to cirrhotic change, and then it is going down to fibrosis and along with hepatocellular carcinoma, okay? So uh, the first thing when we actually try to understand, right now, you see here, you saw the density of uh, the liver that has been lower than the spleen. So which means to say you have to correlate your observation, this observation with the, the liver function tests, okay? Liver function test. Now you tell me 
what on liver function test will you actually be looking at? Yes, right now you got a big differential diagnosis. You have got cirrhosis, hepatomegaly, and fatty liver. So what could have actually caused this condition? And where you are going to actually find this evidence? Yes, you are obviously going to look at and you are LFT, which is the liver function test. Okay, what on liver function test are you going to look down for? Other people too? Billy Rubin? Okay. What else do you have? See, why are you not asking me some other question before you actually look down into the liver function test? You are not asking me two important questions. What are the two important questions you are missing down in the history? The two important questions we missed down in the history is that if there is a fever and if there is jaundice. Yes or no? Fever and jaundice are the two important questions we will be ignoring here. So the patient, if it is a cirrhosis, the patient may not technically present up with the fever but the present the patient may come up with jaundice, but it is related down to, you know, hepatocellular carcinoma, or if it is related down to, you know, uh, Hodgkin's lymphomas, or if it is related down to, uh, you know, more of a hepatic abscess-like condition, yes, you will be having fever. And also, you will be having, if there is any kind of a conditions of inflammation, like uh, cholecystitis, yes, you will be having hypertension, jaundice, and fever as well. Okay, so first we need to ask that question uh, if there is a presence of a jaundice. Yes, we are going to look at bilirubin, but Shafi, tell me one thing if you are going to look at bilirubin, is it going to tell you anything about uh, liver function or is it going to tell you if the patient has jaundice or no jaundice? It will just only answer your question about the jaundice, but it will not be telling you anything about the status of the liver function. So what are the parameters of the liver function? What are the main components that you should be looking down in the liver function? Cholesterol levels will tell me about my lipid things. Okay, what are those two enzymes, Shubham? What are those two enzymes? ALT and AST, right? SGOT and SGPT, okay? L9 transferase and aspartase, right? So both of them we are be looking at the ratio as SGOT and SGPT, the ratio of ALT AST ratio, right? ALT is two. AST ratio, when we are looking at this kind of ratio, yes, we are going to get a clear idea if there is any liver failure or not. Yes or no? Bilirubin will actually tell you if there is related to the obstructive jaundice or non-obstructive jaundice. But SGOT and SGPT, ALT or AST, are the one that is actually indicating if the patient is present down in a condition of a hepatic cirrhosis or if he's present down in the hepatic fibrosis, or he's extending or progressing down into a condition as hepatocellular carcinomas. Did you get it? And now you look at this image and you tell me if this patient will be having a poor hepatic function or not. Yes or no? See, we came to find out that the density of the liver is much more lower than the density of the spleen and it is looking much more lower it is almost showing up of as you know uh, very very related down to you know something less than 20s okay if it is showing up less than 20 Hounsfield units yes obviously i am going to look the patient will be having a very very poor hepatic function okay 
and you can see here even also in this image it is completely distributed all over the so many segments of the liver okay caudate lobe of the liver has been uh, affected and then again the five and six segments have been uh, you know affected down it means to say almost the complete right lobe of almost 60 to 70 percent of the light lobe of the liver has been completely completely hypodense fatty changes have been there so which means to say the patient might be suffering from alcoholic cirrhosis alcoholic hepatitis you get it okay so how i was able to make down a diagnosis okay or first i tried to observe that the patient has no fever no jaundice but has a history of alcoholism yes obviously i am going to think that the patient is obviously going to have some kind of a cirrhotic changes and then i'm going to look for that kind of evidence and i'm going to prove it on my ct so that's the reason did you understand how the doctor was able to associate and correlate with his history and clinical presentation and making and proving it on observing on the computer tomographic images yes so that is how we are using that kind of information all right so this is one of the you know most classical examples we usually uh, you know millions of other examples also then other thing is that you see here the spleen is usually about 12 centimeters long and it does not project substantially below the margin of the 12th rib okay and it is also about the same size as the left kidney as well yes uh, there is a uh, uh, um, alcoholic cirrhosis and non-alcoholic cirrhosis too okay that was a nice question uh, but generally you know we cannot differentiate between alcoholic cirrhosis and non-alcoholic cirrhosis on a radiological imaging we will be actually looking down at the ratios of the alt and the ast and the albumin levels in such kind of a situation okay so alt and alt ratio will generally be you know uh, the balance is completely gone uh, in case of uh, uh, you know, alcoholic related uh, uh, cirrhosis, which actually you say that we will be looking at the microvesicular or the micronodular changes, okay? Vesicular and nodular changes, which actually happens in case of a hepatic steatosis, we will be looking at microvesicular uh, uh, changes, okay? But uh, there will be no nodular. So if it is that one it is related down to alcoholism okay microvesicular changes are related down to alcoholism but if there are nodules that are present yes it is a cirrhosis condition and yes it can be happening because of hepatocellular carcinoma or it can be happening because of non-alcoholic cirrhosis as well okay non-alcoholic cirrhosis is just generally a plain hepatosis hepatosteosis okay right Okay, but we will be correlating more with the laboratory studies rather than depending on the radiology as well. Okay, but if there is a microvesicular change, if it is in the early stages, okay, generally we cannot differentiate between alcoholic and non-alcoholic cirrhosis. It is difficult, but in advanced cases, yes, it might be possible because uh, vesicular changes and the nodular changes can be seen both on radiology and lab testings as well. Okay, that way we can divide. Only in advanced stages we can. Uh, do it okay right now the situation what we were talking about is the liver uh, sorry the spleen the spleen weighs actually you know 12 centimeters long and it does not project substantially below the 12th margin of the rib okay if you can remember the palpation technique okay have you completed down the diagnostics and palpation of uh, abdomen in diagnostics class did you complete it or you didn't No, okay, fine. Then I will not get in down into more details of that one. Remember, there is a clinical condition called as the megaly, right? Cardiomegaly. Cardiomegaly means to say enlargement of the heart. The same way you have got hepatomegaly, enlargement of the liver, and we got splenomegaly, enlargement of the spleen, right? Yesterday I was talking, actually talking about a condition called as non-Hodgkin's lymphoma where you will be seeing hepatomegaly and splenomegaly, right? So for the assessment of the splenomegaly, what we generally do, as a fact, we know that the spleen does not exist, 
uh, you know, substantially extend beyond the margin of the 12th rib. But if it is extending beyond that one, and if it is size is greater than 12 centimeters, we can generally picturize the condition as splenomegaly on a CT. Okay, right? And coming down hepatomegaly and splenomegaly occurring together, yes, you have to suspect always about the lymphomas. Okay. Uh, but if it is there only hepatomegaly without splenomegaly, yes, you have to always suspect a condition that is related down to liver. Okay. Right. And only splenomegaly, you should be relating down to a condition of immunocompromised conditions. Okay. Right. So uh, uh, remember this one as a simple thing, but uh, it may not be necessary right now at this level. Okay. Right now. The next one is the most important structure we're going to look at is a pancreas. Remember, pancreas is a retroperitoneal organ, obliquely oriented so that the entire organ is not seen on only one axial image of the abdomen. See, the pancreas is a leaf-like structure. It is a long structure. It has, it is not, it is not present down in a straight line. It is not present in the transverse line. Okay, it will be present down diagonally, obliquely oriented from superior to inferior, extending down in the retroperitoneum. Okay, extending down from the anterior to uh, sorry, posterior to anterior, and that's the reason we cannot look at the complete view of the pancreas in just only one slice. Okay, to observe the pancreas, we will be actually looking at three simultaneous slices. Okay, and what we are actually looking for is that we are looking at the three different parts of the pancreas. Okay, so pancreas has got three different areas, which we have got the head, body, and the tail. Okay, remember, pancreas has got three different parts, the head, body, and the tail. And see here, the tail is usually the most superior and lying in the hilum of the spleen at that level what we were looking at before and then proceeding inferiorly when we move down a slice a, a little bit down the body of the pancreas crosses the midline and rests on the anterior to the superior mesenteric artery okay the head of the pancreas is nestled in the duodenal loop as well and then the uncinate process is a part of the head and curves around the mesenteric vein as well okay uh, Generally, the duodenum is coming more on to the right side from left side to the right side. Okay, first part and second parts of the duodenum. Okay, which is entirely different. Uh, so uh, now we can actually see here the proceeding inferiorly, the body of the pancreas crosses the midline and rests on the anterior to the superior mesenteric artery. Okay, I will actually show you in the images. We can define that one there. And then we have got the uncinate process, which is the part of the head and curves around the superior mesenteric queen. So which one has got the relation with which one? Okay, this can be asked as a question. Okay, the body of the pancreas has got a relation with the superior mesenteric artery. The uncinate process has got a relation with the superior mesenteric queen. Okay, look at this image here. Okay, we are looking at a, you know, heterogeneous uh, structure. Okay, heterogeneous structure. At the same level, we can see here, this is the body of the pancreas, okay? Body of the pancreas. And you can actually see here, we can see here there are two, uh, you know, visualized adrenal glands here, technically. You see here, suprarenal glands, we call them as, okay? Just above the kidneys, we have got small curve-like structures here. These are the adrenal glands, okay? present about the liver and at the same point of time we can also be looking down at the you see here uh, we will be looking down at the gallbladder okay which is a oval shaped and large structure okay big structure oval structure okay which is uh, almost homogeneous density okay and this density is much more lower than the spleen and the liver Okay, so this is the gallbladder. So we are looking at the inferior surface of the liver. Okay, so this is the place where the 
uh, you know, body of the pancreas is here. And immediately posterior to the body of the pancreas, we are looking at this splenic artery. You see here, you can see that the artery entering down into the spleen, right? Okay. So this one is the splenic artery and this is the spleen. So at this level, I am going to look down at the pancreas. But generally, this is much more superior, right? And inferiorly, when we are looking down at the much more lower level, you see here, I'm looking at the head of the pancreas. Okay, when I move down along a little bit, when I'm looking at a little bit down, uh, uh, I'm looking at the body of the pancreas, okay? And then tail is much more superior and body of the pancreas, okay? See, the body of the pancreas is much more inferior. So here we are going to look at much more inferior levels. Inferior levels in the sense, okay, that is the place where I can start looking down at the kidneys as well. Okay, when you can see the kidneys, you have to recognize that you are looking down at the head of the pancreas. When I'm looking at the head of the pancreas, okay, what will be opening from it? It will be opening down as the pancreatic duct, or sorry, common bile duct. So common bile duct will be opening down into the duodenum. So here I will be looking down at the duodenum first part and then the engine it will be opening down something down from the pancreatic duct will be opening down into the second part of the duodenum so i will be looking at the second part of the duodenum here so it is extending from the left side to sorry right side to the left side okay uh, it may not be uh, necessary at this level for you but remember always recognize the body of the pancreas head of the pancreas and tail of the pancreas okay right then the splenic vein actually courses along the posterior border of the pancreas to the superior mesenteric vein. And the splenic artery runs along the border of the superior border of the pancreas from the celiac axis to the spleen. Okay, these all things are, you know, generally very confusing. Uh, to make it much more easier, uh, we will try to look along the images. Okay, I will explain this one once again when we are uh, overall uh, looking at the... Uh, you know the ct scan okay i have got a ct scan with me and i will show that one but first we will try to understand uh, and try to remember them the splenic vein courses along the posterior border of the pancreas to the superior mesenteric vein and the splenic artery runs along the superior border of the pancreas from the celiac axis to the spleen so it is just talking about the mesenteric plexus along with the celiac axis the main pancreatic duct empties into the duodenum as the duct of Virsang. Okay, the main pancreatic duct opens down with the duct of Virsang and sometimes through an accessory duct of Santoridi. Okay, remember these two names. Okay, it actually opens down from the head of the pancreas. Okay, uh, pancreatic duct and then uh, moves along the uh, along the head of the pancreas. We have got the common bile duct but pancreatic duct will be present down in the body and the tail. So they will be opening down as the duct of Virsang and the accessory duct of Santorini. Remember these two names. Okay, I will show them later on in the CT scan right now. And then we have got the kidneys. The kidneys are much more retroperitoneal organs encircled by a various amounts of fat and encircled with a fibrous capsule. Okay. Uh, Retroperitoneal structures, antiperitoneal structures, I think you should have done yesterday in the anatomy practical slides as well. If you done, if you have you done it or you didn't do it? If you didn't do it, you know, it is going to take much more longer time and uh, it is going to take a lot of explanation. You should have already learned these things in anatomy. So that's the reason I'm actually trying to move fast. If not, there is a lot of content to explain only for the anatomy as well. So did you guys read the practical slides yesterday or no? OK. OK, for the people who did not actually read that one, make sure that you are going to read it well, OK? Because uh, this chapter will be confusing if you do not understand that one. Okay, it is for your own practice. Even if I explain like 100 times also, you will not be able to recognize the structures because you did not practice yourselves. Okay, right. 
So the kidneys are the retroperitoneal organs and they have got fat and a fibrous capsule. Okay, so they will be showing up fat densities. They are surrounded by a peridial space, okay, which is actually called as the perirenal space. Okay, you see here, this is the kidney, K, okay, and it has got an encapsulated encapsulate, structure. Okay, this is the fat which you will be looking at. And then this space is actually called as the perirenal space. Okay, and B before uh, you know anterior to the perirenal space we call it as anti antiperitoneum and this one we call it as the retroperitoneum okay the space is present is actually called as the antiperitoneal space where you will be having the pancreas and the duodenums but in the posterior side we will be having pararenal space and retrorenal space. In the retrorenal space, we will be having the inferior vena cava and the abdominal iota, right? In the posterior renal space, we will be having fat, okay? So that is how the contents of the abdomen are divided down, okay? Ra not only making along the divisions down as the middle, upper and middle and lower uh, abdomen, this is also done on the sliced sections as the antiperitoneum and the retroperitoneum. So do not ignore these, uh, you know, spaces. I will be dealing more about this one in the urogenital system as well. But first, you have to understand here one thing that the kidneys are surrounded by a space which is actually called as the perirenal space. Okay, because of the capsules present, and this one is actually happening because of the anterior and posterior renal fascia. Okay, anterior and posterior renal spatiae are the ones that are actually giving down the anterior pararenal spaces and the retro pararenal spaces. Okay, and also we got the posterior pararenal spaces as well. So three things coming down together and the one most important things, okay, you have to understand that which structure is the retroperitoneal organ? What the questions that can be asked down here is that, okay, what are the structures that comes down in the retroperitoneum? What are the structures that are present down in the antiperitoneum? So that is what you have to grasp here. Okay, now understand one thing. If there is a presence of, you know, if there is a presence of ascites, will you be looking down at the fluid in the perirenal spaces? Is it possible for us to look down the space uh, in any kind of a shadow in case of ascites in the perirenal spaces? Yes or no? Will you be able to look if there is ascites, a fluid like density in the perirenal space? Yes, no. Answer me, guys. No. No, right? Did you understand? What is the reason behind it? Because it is a separate space, it is a separate. Uh, you know, it is separate division where you will not be looking at, but you might be looking at a fluid density in the posterior pararenal spaces, right? And the anterior pararenal spaces, yes or no? Because that one is actually belonging to the intestinal regions and this one is actually the de dependent area. The posterior side is the most dependent area. So that's the reason you will be looking at the fluid like density along these regions, but not along the density of the kidney. So that is how I am using this information here, okay? Right, clear? Now, in an adult, you also should be knowing aware, aware of this fact that the left kidney is minimally larger than the right kidney. And each kidney is generally about 11 centimeters in size or almost the same size of the spleen. And somebody tell me which kidney is present higher and which kidney is present lower? Which kidney is present higher and which kidney is present lower? Left is higher and right is lower. Okay, is there any reason behind it? No, the answer is not liver.
see the answer to this question actually lies down in embryology when you know the when the fetus is actually formed what happens is that both of the liver uh, both of the kidneys are usually present down at the same level okay it is both usually present down at the same level but what happens that the right kidney is actually moving a little lower because it has to provide the space for the peritoneal structures okay not only because of the liver but also because of the intestines as well so they will be moving a little bit down it is not only exactly because of the liver but it is also about the distribution of the mesenteric structures as well okay so right kidney is lower and the left kidney is higher now so the kidneys are as long as the kidneys are functioning properly generally they are the major route for excretion of the iodinated contrast materials uh, we will be talking more about these details in urogenital system uh, but a little understand one thing here uh, like when i said that the contrast enhancer studies are generally used for functional dynamic uh, you know imaging okay when they are knowing for the physiological function the same how we are doing down to uh, you know the enhancement patterns looking down at the enhancement patterns of the liver trying to assess its functional capacity the same way we are actually going to look at the amount of coordinated contrast material that is being excreted out because the kidneys are the excretory structures. So depending on the density, we are going to see, and depending upon the time, we are going to assess if there is a normal GFR or if there is an ultrafiltration rate is adequate or not. So this one, it directly tells me about the, it's the functional status of the kidney. But specifically speaking, okay, now let me ask you a question. What is the main parameter of finding out the functional status of the kidney? When, uh, when you are talking about ALT and ASD ratio, which is a direct indicator of the liver function, what is the parameter that is necessary for assessing the renal function? glomerular filtration rate as well as glomerular filtration rate as well as as well as urine output perfect answer creatinine levels you know creatinine levels are generally not a direct indicator of uh, uh, you know uh, current levels of uh, uh, acute uh, see, because there are two kinds of conditions, which is actually called as acute kidney injury and the chronic kidney disease, right? There are two types of diseases, AKD and CKD, right? Chronic kidney disease and acute kidney disease. Yes, for acute conditions, yes, creatinine levels may be uh, beneficial. But for chronic conditions, yes, creatinine levels, urine amount, urine output, and uh, sorry, I, I'm telling the opposite. Uh, for a chronic condition, yes, the creatinine levels are important. But for an acute thing, yes, glomerular filtration rate and urine output are the major contributors. Okay. Uh, creatinine levels are from chronic conditions and acute conditions of uh, GFR and the urine output are the most important parameters. Okay. So which is actually the component of the renal function tests. Did you start your lab diagnostics classes yet? Okay, right. Oh, Aman, uh, you are asking, okay, if the urethra is blocked, there, but there is a prostate cancer, there is no urine output, but the kidneys functions properly. Yes, you see, the answer lies in your question itself. The answer lies in your question itself. Urethra is a structure which is actually where you see, uh, which is passing through the uh, prostate uh, in case of males and in case of prostate cancer or benign prostatic hyperplasia, it is only blocking down the urine that has been already formed down in the bladder. So that's the reason only urine output is less. But the urine output, generally you see here, for assessing down the urine output, people will not be asking down a question, how much urine you pass in a day? No, that is not how we do it. 
urine output is generally done down by a catheter okay so what is the catheter that is used for uh, uh, what is the catheter used for assessing down the urine output how do you monitor it how do you monitor urine output urine output is generally monitored through foley's catheter okay foley's catheter foley's catheter okay due to the presence okay generally uh, urine output is generally measured that way but yes hisham is correct as well but if it is having been uh, if the condition has been you know been a long term and you will be having mostly dysuria but uh, it generally doesn't occur as a sudden urine output okay there will be less urine output but there will be no sudden complete blockage of the uh, you know unless there is so there is when you are trying to analyze the glomerular filtration rate you will be actually looking at three conditions right polyuria and urea and oligouria right so that one actually a urea oligouria and polyuria will generally indicate that there is increased fluid inside the kidneys and increased fluid inside the kidneys what will does what will that do to the enhancement of the kidneys will it become lower or higher tell me see somebody was uh, telling me before an answer called as hydronephrosis okay so now that person tell me i think it must be reshma or somebody i don't exactly remember you were telling about hydronephrosis if you are looking at hydronephrosis now can you tell me what could be the you know enhancement pattern what could be the density that you are expecting down in a kidney on a ct scan will it be higher lower hyperdensity or hypodensity okay fine somebody has told me hy uh, hydronephrosis before it will be lower density now did you understand see we are suspecting down a clinical condition so if we see lower densities along the kidney don't you think that we should also be looking down at the parameters of glomerular filtration rate as well yes or no so we are going to correlate it clinically and try to see if there is enough urine output or not if there is no enough urine output but still hydronephrosis is present yes the differential diagnosis comes down to prostatic cancer kidney stones and other conditions did you understand aman right now why how i use this information yes i saw a lower density on the kidneys but still there is no the gfr seems to be completely adequate right now it means to say i it is suggesting the doctor to look down into the distal organs rather than looking into the proximal organs or looking at the nephrons and going down for an intravenous pyelography right so we will be doing about two conditions okay when the first class when we are talking about the imaging modalities we talked about three conditions there we talked about intravenous pyelography we are we talked about micturating urethrogram right and we are talking about generally uh, nf program so we are going to change our imaging modality when we are actually suspecting a condition of hydronephrosis okay so hydronephrosis is usually detected on ultrasound when a patient complains of with a urine output problem okay if there is a problem with dysuria so first what i'm going to do is that i'm going to look down in the ultrasound and in the bedside and i'm trying to expect that there might be kidney stones or prostatic condition as well so that i'm going to look down for complete abdominal survey and then i'm trying to decide if i am going to go for a ct scan or not then i'm going to make a complete exploration of the organs in a slice view did you understand now right now we have got three steps whenever a patient complains of less urine output we are going to talk down to the patient down to an ultrasound then we make and see if there is any hydronephrotic changes as well and then when we see that there is an evidence of an hydronephrotic change yes we are going to recommend the patient down to a ct scan and then we are going to examine down for the proximal or distal conditions so proximal conditions yes will be happening because of conditions like renal tuberculosis or will be happening because of uh, kidney stones pelvic stones okay uh, nephrolithiasis we call this condition as 
that is the proximal obstruction. But if the distal obstruction is to say, I'm looking at the urethral stones, uh, urethrolithiasis, or then we are looking at the uh, bladder stones, which means to say cystolithiasis, or we are going to look at the prostate area, uh, which means to say I'm looking at BPH and I'm going to look at for prostate cancers as well. Did you understand right now how the protocol went down from one set to another set? Yes, is this point clear now, guys? Right now, okay. So we should not only be, you know, looking at the, you know, uh, the radiographic changes, but you should be also be aware of the protocol, okay? So while you are reading down the abdomen, please read it this way so that your next steps of internal medicine and surgery becomes more easy, okay? Right? Now, the other conditions is that, okay, let us say the kidney is functioning or not properly, the contrast excreted through the alternative pathways where it will be going down through the bowel and the bowel and it is actually called as vicarious excretion of the contrast so right now i have got a patient with diabetes mellitus okay i have got a patient with diabetes mellitus who has also has a condition of congestive heart failure so right now when i took an abdominal scan to him Right now, when I have taken an abdominal scan to him, I have been seeing there has been a passive enhancement of the bile and the bowel. I have been seeing a hyperdense bile ducts in the liver. And I'm also looking at these mucosal layers or the hostration layers that has been enhanced, that has become more bright. Now, let us come back to the first case we have been discussing about. Do you remember, do you still remember the case what we talked in the first while we started this class? Yes? Okay, now let me repeat the clinical history of that guy once again. A 68 year old male comes down to, okay, a 60 year old male comes down to the emergency clinic with a complaint of abdominal bloating and distension, okay? and he has a history of hypertension, okay? And eventually I came to find out that the patient also is diabetic. And he has a fever right now, okay? He has a fever right now. And what is the diagnosis I must be thinking about? I came down to a conclusion called as paralytic ileus. Right now, what are the radiographic features I'm going to expect in this patient? Yes. I am going to expect a poorly functional kidney because that the congestive heart failure and the diabetic comorbidities, diabetes mellitus comorbidities are going to directly affect the function of the kidneys. Yes or no? And I will also be able to looking down because it is happening. Why? Because the congestive heart failure has got BP changes. Diabetes mellitus has also got BP changes, right? Both of them are working together. So what happens? The circulation to the the circulation to the inferior vena cava, which the liver has been come, supplied by the portal vein, has also a known condition called as portal hypertension as well. Right? When you know there is a portal hypertension, which means to say there will be dilatation of the portal vein. If there is a dilatation of the portal vein, what happens? It is going to compress the surrounding arterial vasculature there, right? So it is going to compress the hepatic artery or it is going to compress the inferior, uh, sorry, uh, it is going to compress the inferior vena cava as well. The direct branches of the inferior vena cava are the superior mesenteric vein. The superior mesenteric vein and the superior mesenteric artery are the one that supplies down to the small intestine. And this, and then also it is going to counteractively compress along the areas of the kidneys as well. So the whole blood compromise, the blood circulation compromise happened down to the mesenteric plexus. And there is a lot of influence on the renal output, okay, filtration rate as well. Right now, that's the reason when there is a compromise in blood circulation to the intestines, what happens? the peristaltic movements of the intestines go vague. 
Did you understand the pathophysiological process now? Why the patient has projected up with an, a dynamic ileus or a paralytic ileus in case of congestive heart failure with a comorbidity of diabetes mellitus? Did you understand now? Yes. Is it confusing or is it quite clear? Do you want me to repeat it once again or do you want? Okay, see, we have a condition called as congestive heart failure, right? Congestive heart failure has got something to do with blood circulation. It has got to do with something with BP, right? It has got a relation directly with your BP. And we know a condition that has been emerging. I think we know it in, in the cardiovascular system. I have been telling it is called as the cardiorenal syndrome. Do you remember that one there? Yes. Cardiorenal syndrome. Do you remember? Yes. Okay. Apply that theory. And another theory here is that, okay, when there is a congestive heart failure, it has got a direct influence onto the inferior vena cava. Yes. And inferior vena cava has got the first main branch as the portal vein. Yes. Okay. Other than the uh, segmental arteries and the, uh, you know, uh, celiac axis. Okay. We, the main, biggest branch is the portal vein. So the influence of the BP is going to give down the expansion of the portal vein. Yes. If there is expansion of the portal vein, what is the structure that is present anterior to the portal vein? What is the structure that is present down anterior to the portal vein? It is the inferior vena cava. So inferior vena cava will be compressed. If there is inferior vena cava that is compressed, and what are the direct branches from the inferior vena cava? Superior mesenteric vein, right? Right, super, right superior mesenteric vein and the left superior mesenteric vein, right? Inferior mesenteric vein and the superior mesenteric vein are the branches coming down, right? Okay. The, they are the ones that are actually supplying down the blood to the ascending colon, descending colon, and the small intestine. Yes, the mesenteric plexus is the one that supplies the blood to the mesenteric colons. All the one, right? All the mesenteric plexus to the all intestines, right? Large intestine and small intestine. And there is a compromise because the inferior vena cava, yes. Into the no, not they do not drain into the portal vein, they drain into the inferior vena cava. Okay, but which one is compressed? Inferior vena cava is compressed because of increased pressure inside the portal vein. You get it, Shafik. Superior mesenteric vein and inferior mesenteric vein are the one that drains down into the inferior vena cava, then drains into the portal vein. Okay then goes down uh, upwards, okay? But portal vein has got a extra dilatation here because of the comorbidity. So which one is being compressed? Inferior vena cava is being compressed. And if, if inferior vena cava is being compressed, okay, almost the other structures like iota are also being influenced. So what happens is that the blood circulation to the mesenteric plexus has been compromised. Okay, anywhere if the blood circulation has been compromised, what is the condition? There will be a failure, right? The failure of the intestines is actually called as paralytic ileus. Did you understand now? Yes, Aman, other guys? Shabhi, Pratishta, yes, did you understand now? So the compromise to the blood circulation is the one that is actually uh, the most important factor. Right now, let me give you another theory, which is much more complex than this. What is the nervous supply to the, uh, you know, what is the nervous supply to the uh, complete, uh, you know, gastrointestinal contents, uh, visceral organs down there? What is the nervous supply? Vagus, lumbar plexus, okay. From the vagus, okay, well, can you tell me what exactly another things? Which one also comes down? I think uh, you should be learning a, a little bit about physiology here. So let me uh, make vague. Okay, uh, let me complete the chapter first and then I will come to that theory next on. Okay, 
normal kidneys you see here the normal kidneys generally should be having a simple hyperdensity okay they should be looking at as the you know uh, without any kind of uh, haziness around them in the perirenal spaces and the retrorenal spaces okay there should be no enhancement there should be homogeneous enhancement and in between that i will be looking down at a hypodensity which is actually telling me that i'm looking at the renal pelvis okay so which one actually eventually opens down so which will be directly connecting down you see here these two structures that are coming down out from the kidney renal pelvis is directly connected down to the iota which means to say i am looking at the renal arteries okay which is looking at the renal arteries and which actually i am looking at the fat containing areas here in between that these fat containing areas are nothing uh, uh, but the hypodensities i am looking at so this is the pancreas i am looking and this is the cystic duct i am looking at okay and then the next one what we, we are actually we are looking at the renal vein here okay renal artery is here and this is the renal vein okay this is opening down into the iota and this one is opening down into the inferior vena cava like this okay so then we have all got all the structures here so uh, can somebody tell me right now we are looking at much more lower levels can somebody tell me what is this structure that we are looking at here what is this structure I'm looking at here. Come on, Shafiq. This is right side. Is this liver or spleen? Liver or spleen? Shafiq. Liver, right? Do not forget the side you are looking at. You are looking at the right side and there on the right side there is liver. Can somebody tell me what segment of the liver are we looking at? Now, kidneys are not superior. Kidneys are inferior. We are looking at the sixth segment. Perfect answer, right? Okay, we are looking at the five and six segments, that is true, but most probably we are be looking at this sixth segment here. Okay. Uh, then we have got the pancreas. Okay, this is the small intestine and this is the fecal content. This is the colon, okay, that we are looking at. Most laterally along the lumbar regions are the colon. Yes, if you can remember, along the flanks, we are looking at the colon and along the midlines, we are looking at the small intestine. So how can I actually differentiate from the small intestine and the large intestine? I'm looking at the diameter. The large intestine has got bigger diameter and volvulae, uh, hostrations in them, okay, which is, uh, you know, uh, not continuous. But uh, small intestine has got continu uh, continuous volvulae conventus. And then I am also looking down along the less diameter than the large intestine, okay? That is how I'm going to recognize this one. Generally, anatomically also, you can recognize them as the ones that are present down more laterally uh, along the lumbar regions are the ones that are the large intestine and along the periumbilical regions are the one is the small intestine, okay? So that is how I recognize them. But can somebody tell me, you see here, this is the vertebrae I'm looking at here. What is the vertebrae I'm looking at? Is it thoracic vertebrae or the lumbar vertebrae? Which one am I looking at? Am, am I looking at thoracic or the lumbar here? Okay, the lumbar vertebrae, look at the shape. It is much more circular, okay? Much more circular, much more bigger, right? And it has got a long spinous process, right? So I'm looking down at the lumbar vertebrae, okay? Then, large bowel and small bowel yes we have already done about this one yesterday so uh, maybe i think generally i will not uh, repeat that once again okay we, since we have already done it right now uh, i think that's uh, what it is uh, most of the times then when we move uh, i will not deal about the large bowel and the small bowel because i have already completed them yesterday okay now 
Next, when we move more inferiorly, what we have is the urinary bladder. Urinary bladder is generally an extraperitoneal organ, and the extraperitoneal space actually is continuous with the retroperitoneum. Okay. The dome of the bladder is converted down into the inferior reflection of the peritoneum. Okay, and along the inferior reflection of the dome of the peritoneum, there is a space, and this is the space we are actually calling it as the pouch of Douglas. Okay, I think we already told you before, uh, but when we look at the simultaneous CT scans, I will actually show you. But this is actually remember, this is the place where the pouch of Douglas will be. The bladder actually measures about 5 mm thickness, okay, uh, and always uh, less distended, okay. Now, you tell me one thing, there is a very, very interesting question here. Since we know that as a fact that right now the bladder has got 5 mm thickness, but let us say if the thickness of the bladder has been increased, what is the disease am I suspecting? If the thickness of the bladder has been increased, what is the disease that I can suspect? Just think and answer. It is a very simple thing. Bladder has got mucosa or epithelial layers. Okay, we can call it as epithelium. If there is enhancement of the epithelium and if there is a thickening of this epithelium, man, when I'm talking about Urinary bladder, why does it come down to prostrate? Prostrate is a separate organ which has got nothing relation to do with the urinary bladder, Shubham. Prostrate is an entirely different organ which belongs to the endocrinal system, right? It is a gland, right? Yes, infection, cystitis, or I might be also suspecting at a case of bladder cancer. Yes, Nitish, you are absolutely correct. So any kind of a patient will actually, you know, uh, Nitish, yes, you are correct. Yeah, Pratibha, Sharma, you are correct. Interstitial cystitis, yes, that is a very, very good answer. Yes, I might be suspecting at a case of cystourethritis or I might be also suspecting a case of bladder cancer, right? Okay, now, generally, the bladder has to be best evaluated when distended with urine or without urine or in contrast, okay? But the bladder wall is usually visible whether or not intravenous contrast has been administered, okay? So, generally, presence of a, uh, you know, a urine inside actually shows up there the bladder has been distended. But if there is no urine inside the bladder, actually the urinary bladder actually looks collapsed. But the bladder wall will be vis visible for us. You look here, this is a contrast enhanced CT. Okay. Uh, where actually I, uh, I am looking at the bladder here. Okay. See, this is not a well distended bladder yet but I can see almost the thickness of the bladder as a simple hyperdensity as a circle around it, right? So this is the bladder thickness. So if there is a bladder thickness, if it is a localized bladder thickness, I can be actually looking at a case of bladder cancer. If it is an, an uh, you know, generalized bladder thickness, I might be looking at a case of interstitial cystitis, okay, right? And then immediately to back of it, I will be looking down at the rectum, okay? So immediately back along to the rectum. The rectum has got inhomogeneous density with it. Okay, there will be small, small black, black dots within and then gray shadows and white shadows, which actually suggests to me this, this is the fecal matter that has been present inside the rectum. And immediately at this space, you see here, there is a small hypodense area. You see here, this is the pouch of Douglas. Okay, this is the pouch of Douglas. So if ever, if at all, there is, because there is any kind of hemorrhage down in the retroperitoneum, you see here, we come to learn that this one is the part of the retroperitoneum. Yes, right? 
the continuation of the bladder is actually a present or part of a retroperitoneal structure, but that has been projected down to anteperitoneum. So it has got a relation down to retroperitoneum anatomically through the fascia, but it is present more to the anteperitoneum, right? It is not a retroperitoneal structure. It has got a relation to the retroperitoneal fascia, okay? So if at all there is some kind of an abnormality or if there is a fluid accumulation or if there is a hemorrhage that has been present inside the retroperitoneum, where am I looking at? I am looking at this area. Understand? Did you understand this? Yes? Same like the way when I'm looking at the costophrenic recesses on the cardiophrenic angles, okay, this is the same way I'm looking at the Morrison's pouch and the pouch of Douglas. So two areas, okay, is this point clear here? Yes or no? Okay, right, so I think that is all uh, for this anatomical class, CT class, okay. Now I wanted to actually tell you a little bit about physiology so that we can actually use this information uh, later on in our other classes, okay? Uh, just give me another 10 minutes. I will try to complete this one. Okay, just give me a minute. I will get my writing pad. So can you uh, guys uh, tell me, is this chapter difficult or easy? Are these chapters difficult or easy? Difficult than the chest one? Not too much difficult. Okay. So why do you why do you guys think it is difficult? Uh, see, generally we cannot uh, blame you guys. You need, maybe it might be getting a little bit of a difficult just because you are unable to. You know, maybe you are based sticking down in the pathology and the pathophysiology and anatomy might be. Uh, you know, a little bit weaker. So I like, I would like to, uh, you know, ask you guys to know about these processes comparatively, okay? Uh, work along with correlation because I could make this class only, just only describing the densities. But I wish I do not because I know that you will be having a lot of, lot of questions later on. So, so that uh, to completely, you know, remove your all other questions that is going to come down in surgery and internal medicine. I'm saying I'm trying my best uh, to complete them here itself so that those subjects will become more easier. OK, so that's the reason maybe these classes will be a little bit in depth, I guess. But generally, it is not exactly necessary in a, uh, a radiology class uh, to do it like this. But since you guys are going to become physicians and surgeons later on, Okay, not a radiologist. I mean, some of you will become a radiologist later on, but most of you people will be, uh, you know, actually practicing with MBBS first. So that's the reason I want you guys to understand the complete correlation. Okay, so that's the reason I am doing it along with the physiological process and anatomy as well. If not, we will be just describing. You see here, we got only 26 slides today, but it took us three hours to understand the whole part, right? OK, anybody who is ever having a difficulty of, uh, you know, physiology, pathology and anatomy, make sure that you learn them right now. OK, because later on, when the diagnosis classes are complete, laboratory diagnostics is complete. OK, radiology is complete. Internal medicine should be easy for you. 
if not if you are not paying attention to these classes you know it will be much more much more difficult and you won't understand anything and you will be making a wrong diagnosis whole of your career okay this is not a warning advice to you guys let me give you right now i'll give you a little bit of a uh, you know basic information that we can use it uh, for tomorrow it is just going it is very simple and uh, very easy to understand a little bit of physiology information okay anatomical and physiology information remember when i was asking about the nervous supply of the gastrointestinal system we have got two things okay we have got the you know submucosal plexus submucosal plexus okay which is also called as the Meissner's plexus okay one thing then we have got the motility plexus okay motility plexus or uh, this one is also called as secretory plexus okay secretory plexus and this one is actually called as motility plexus or this one is myentric plexus okay right so we have got and this one has got another name we also called it as our back plexus okay did you hear these terms before if not make yourself familiar about this one okay we have got two nervous supplies to the gastrointestinal system okay we have got the submucosal plexus which is actually the function is actually it is controlling down the secretions and it is actually known as the Meissner's plexus then we have got the motility plexus or the myentric plexus okay which is actually supplying the myentry myentra okay which actually controls the motility the peristaltic movements this one is also known as the horseback plexus simple okay now, any kind of a problem that is related down, okay, this one are the direct branches from the vagus nerve. Okay, these are the direct branches from the vagus nerve. So any kind of a problem that is related down to the vagus nerve has got a direct influence onto this one as well. Okay, when we are trying to deal about the pathology, we are actually going down into correlation with these things. Okay, when we are learning about the diseases of esophagus, diseases of stomach, diseases of intestine, we are going to use this information. So remember them, okay? Now, is this point clear here? Do you remember this one? Okay, which one controls the secretions and which one controls the motility? Yes or no? Right? Yes? Okay, then we have got another thing. Let us try to understand the process of digestion a little, okay? process of digestion has got three conditions okay uh, we can generally say that it actually digestion process has got three things okay it has got saliva digestion is actually started down in the oropharynx itself okay then we have got a gastric digestion which is actually called as a stomach digestion or gastric digestion okay which happens here and then we have got the pancreatic secretion, which is actually pancreatic digestion, okay, which is actually happening because of pancreatic enzymes, right? Pancreatic secretions, right? Okay. Then generally, this digestion will actually eventually do the cell saliva is actually going to digestion, lubrication, and protection. Okay, digestion, lubrication digestion lubrication and protection okay that is the first thing we actually get it okay then they will be then gastric okay i'm can i remove it this is quite simple here there is nothing much bigger information to understand here it has got an important function right then we have got gastric secretion gastric secretion this is the important part you have to understand okay Gastric secretion will be generally taken down by, you know, different cells of the stomach. If you can remember, okay. This is information is necessary to understand the peptic ulcer diseases and their radiographic features. So that's the reason I'm including them here. Okay. We have got, you know, surface cells, 
okay we have got the parietal cells okay surface cells we have got the parietal cells okay and we have got the histamine producing cells histamine producing cells okay and we have got the enterochromaffin cells okay or the chief cells okay we have got the chief cells chief cells okay this one are also called as enterochromaffin cells okay and then we have got the next cells right so these are the one actually you know all the things that actually you know does the gastric secretions right now what you actually have to understand here is that each one of have was one has got a specific function right surface cells are the one that actually secretes the mucus and maintains the acidity acid neutralizer okay acid neutralizer right parietal cells are the one that actually produce the uh, produce the acid right produce the acid and also they are going to you know produce the intrinsic factor b12 which is also called as castle factor okay it is also called as castle factor then enterochromaffin cells or the histamine cells are generally they are called as they produce histamine where there is by hd3 okay then chief cells are the one that actually releases pepsin chief cells release pepsin next cells are the one that are stem cells stem cells is the one that actually reproduces the cell right reproduces the gastric mucosa right now different sets of diseases let me tell you how exactly let us say if there is an increased secretion of the mucus what do we call that condition as increased secretion of the mucus what do we call that condition as okay if there is less acid neutralization what do we call that condition as acidity ulcer right increased mucus secretions okay or gastritis we might call it as that right so it has got something to do with the relation of the surface cells and the parietal cells right so surface cells and the parietal cells okay this one is actually one of the mucosal layer i am looking at right so now let us say if the patient has been complaining okay if the patient has been complaining about the you know the uh the mucosa uh okay did you guys write it down i think i had ran out of this battery oh my god okay if I have been, uh, did you guys write those all things? Okay. If there is any kind of a relation between the surface cells and the parietal cells, so what will be the condition of that mucosa there? Will it be thickened or will it be, you know, less dense, thickened? Or there will be, you know, any rupture, disruption to that one? See, anything is a possibility, right? So we are going to look at for the according to the S erosions and other things. So that one is the one that direct radiographic feature that we are going to look at in that kind of condition. You get it? When we are trying to make a diagnosis of a GERD, when we are trying to make a diagnosis of Barrett's esophagus, when we are trying to make a diagnosis of gastritis, peptic ulcer diseases, gastric carcinoma. Yes, I'm going to look down along the functions of these cells. Okay, that is where I am using this information. Let us say the patient also has got nausea and vomiting. Okay, what are the things that are actually being produced down here? Or if the patient actually also has got less of histamine. So if there is less of histamine, what is the symptom that I might be expecting? Yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, but because I uh, actually that went off. If there is a histamine, less of histamine, Okay, if there is less of histamine or increased histamine, 
what is the thing that actually conditions what is that condition called as inflammation right allergies inflammation okay if it is pi ht3 what is this pi ht3 actually also does pi ht3 also actually has got a thing that has to do with secretions right okay now let us say if the chief cells are producing chief cells are producing pepsin okay what is the disruption in the pepsin called as if there is abnormal production or uh, you know inadequate production of uh, you know uh, pepsin what is that condition called as No, no, I'm not asking about the end product. I'm talking about the what is the condition called as if there is cheap cells or are unable to produce a lot of pepsin. What is that condition called as dyspepsia? Yes, right. OK. OK, if there is no production of the next cells, which are the stem cells, next cells are the stem cells. If there is no production of the gastric mucosa, so what will be looking at? Or if the next cells have been chiefly activated a lot, there is a lot of production of lot of stem cells. OK, which means to say the mucosa has been replaced over and over. What is that condition called as healing? And how does a healing appear down to be like fibrosis? And how does a fibrosis may appear down on a radiology? They might be appearing down as hyperdensities. Yes or no? Did you get it? Are you understanding how I'm actually utilizing this information there? So try to understand the symptoms. Try to understand. You see, try to understand the symptoms. Try to understand the pathophysiological mechanisms behind this. OK, now yesterday I was telling you about a single thing which I was talking about. OK, there is a presence of a food inside the stomach. Uh, is the one that is actually the process of the digestion is the one that is actually influencing your patterns on the abdomen, right? The patterns of the intestine, but it is uh, and also it is not the presence or uh, sorry, no, it is not the type of the food you are consuming, which is actually causing this process of digestion. No, the time of digestion is actually depend on the type of food you have consumed. But the movements of the intestine are directly related down to two conditions. OK, the motility controlled by the Orsbach plexus is directly related down to two conditions. It is only either you eat food, which means to say it is called as a fed pattern, fed state pattern, or fasting pattern. Okay, fed state pattern or fasting pattern. It is the only thing, the presence of food or absence of food inside the stomach. Or or the intestines, digested food or partially digested food doesn't matter. I'm talking about the whole GIT here. OK, it is dependent only due to the presence of food or the non presence of food. That's it. OK, so what actually happens is that whenever there is a presence of a food, you will be uh, sorry. Whenever there is a presence of a food, you will be having a thing that is actually called as the response peristaltic movement so let us see how the peristaltic movement actually happens here okay let us say there is a food content that is present down here in any part of the intestine be it stomach any part of the intestine okay you can actually take this one as pieces as well doesn't matter which one okay doesn't matter which one it, let us say this is some kind of a particle especially partially digested food or impartially digested food okay if this is there, you get a response to the mucosa from the Orsbox plexus. Then what actually happens? Let us say if this is the proximal part of the intestine. And this is the distal part of the intestine. 
what actually happens is that according to the peristaltic movement that is happening here the food will be forwarded to the distal segments i think you know this as a fact right yes and then this segments you know contracts and the food is moved down into the next segment as well okay yes or no so this is the movement uh, the forward movement of the food yes do you know this i think you understand this one right yes okay now let us say if there is a valve here which are generally talking about the valvular conventis or the hostrations we are talking about and we also have got mucosa villus here everything okay now let us say if there is any disruption of these things which can be happening because of its physiological mechanisms or if it is happening because of any pathological mechanisms don't you think that it is going to influence this digestion here yes or no yes or no yes before what we learned actually in uh, this uh, subject here in this chapter we learned that okay whenever there is an enhancement of the kidney there will be also enhancement of the mucosa of the intestines as well but let us say there was an enhancement of the kidneys but there is no enhancement of this mucosa so which condition could i be looking at i am looking at a condition which is actually affecting the mucosa of these intestines so what could be that condition it can be a condition of irritable bowel syndrome it can be a condition of ulcerative colitis it can be a condition of crohn's disease it can be a condition of celiac sprue right so this is the microstructure that is what i am looking at so that's the reason contrast enhanced ct is the one that is providing me all this information did you get it so we are looking based on the densities right now we are trying to prove is our diagnosis being correlated today with always okay today uh, uh, it is always about the pathophysiological changes i am looking at so all the structure all the structures has got some kind of a physiological mechanism a clear understanding of your physiological mechanisms is going to make your radiological investigation quite easy okay so it is not confusing it is just not difficult as well it is much more easier than respiratory and cardiovascular systems just because you don't know this simple basic okay right now how does this actually peristaltic movements been controlled the peristaltic movement is controlled okay peristalsis is controlled by two things it is controlled by acetyl choline and it is controlled by substance p okay and what actually this one does is the contraction so we have got a proximal segment and a distal segment okay this one is the proximal and this one is the distal so the contraction here is done by the acetylcholine and the substance p then we have got the relaxation okay we have got the relaxation which is controlled by nitric oxide and the vaso active peptide did you hear this name before vip vaso active peptide yes okay nitrous oxide so what does this one do this one does relaxation now you see here now do you remember the first case what we were talking about the first case we were talking about is a condition of myocardial infarction the condition was having congestive heart failures vasoactive amines exactly now right now you have got the point see there is a decrease of the vasoactive peptides in myocardial infarction patient so that's the reason that patient is more liable to produce a paralytic ileus as well and you see here 
nitrous oxide is one of the most important neurotransmitter here so if there is a decrease of sodium if there is a decrease of sodium the condition called as a hyponatremia which is also again causing the contraction problems of the heart which is also causing the contraction problems of the intestines which is also causing the contraction problems of the smooth muscles okay relaxation okay generally say relaxation problems not exactly contractions okay it is causing the problems down into the contractions and relaxations of the intestine so, smooth muscles the heart hyponatremia will also lead down to paralytic ileus so i am looking down at the lab test of that particular patient i will be looking down at all these things did you understand why it, why i am using this lab diagnostic test and history first rather than utilizing the radiographic features first because a dynamic ileus is a paralytic ileus which is a generalized condition which is happening as a intestine as a whole but small bowel intersection in uh, you know small bowel obstruction is happening only in the small bowel large bowel obstruction is happening only in the large bowel it has got to do with only pathophysiological mechanisms related down to only large bowel depending on the digestion that happens down in the large bowel okay condition that has been digested there duodenum jejunum stomach if we are aware of that one yes we are going to classify diseases as this one okay the pathophysiology is the one that is actually divided these classes all these diseases okay right so is this point clear did you understand if you are going to learn physiology and pathology if you are revising them yes try to revise them in such kind of a way so that we will be utilizing that information if not the mechanisms or the radiographic features i am going to explain from tomorrow's uh, sorry from the next week's class which is the pathology the biggest section which is technically going to take 3 weeks of time we have a lot to learn there pathology is the biggest part and it is, it is very very important and do not ever forget you will be having an essay question from gastrointestinal system gastrointestinal system cardiovascular respiratory and cns the possibility of essay questions so do not ignore this chapter and the pathology of the gastrointestinal system is much more vast uh, than the respiratory system so make sure that you learn them and come okay if not it is going to take a long time for me to complete these classes because you won't be understanding them yes okay and the last thing we are going to talk about is a very simple thing that is called as migratory motor complex ever heard of this term migratory motor complex which we also call it as mmc okay this one actually happens if there is no food inside the stomach so what actually does this one is that whenever there is no presence of food inside the stomach it sends a signal to the colon directly to make and removal of foreign bodies removal of foreign bodies and cause bacterial accumulation gut flora okay fasting actually improves your foreign body removal and bacterial accumulation okay whenever the stomach is empty every day it gives a signal down to colon through a thing, sink system called as migratory motor complex okay and this one actually what is done is it is actually mediated by a thing called as motilin okay it is actually controlled by a condition called as uh, enzyme called as motilin and what actually it does is that it cleans down your colon it cleans your colon every 90 minutes now yesterday i was asking you a question okay whenever a person has got an urge of defecation immediately after eating food so what could be the condition 
it is actually something that has got to do with the migratory motor complex so fasting complexes has been activated which means to say the person is actually suffering from malabsorption syndromes so he immediately got all the contents so what happens increased peristaltic movements increased peristaltic movements is that means to say the patient will be having dyspepsia all the contents of the stomach are removed and finally migrated down to the uh, duodenum jejunum and finally reaching the small intestine which means to say the things that has to be absorbed down in the stomach are not absorbed and finally they are being defecated as well right in over time so what actually happens is that the patient will become more thin more lethargic more malnourished so that it could be the condition that might be leading down to carbohydrate protein conditions metabolic mal malnutrition disorders did you understand right now so the condition of the radiographic features of quashiorker merasmus are actually find out here it is related down to this theory here okay so that we will be talking about malabsorption syndromes as well when we are trying to look at we are trying to look at this one so when there is no bacterial accumulation as well for every 90 minutes you don't have this migratory motor complex response what happens is that there will be a very very big difficulty for us right so what happens gut flora is gone we will be having series of malabsorptions we will be having anemias we will be having a lot of conditions like diarrhea constipation right we will be losing weight or we will be losing gain uh, gaining weight so that is what the whole process is did you understand so different different comorbidity conditions actually will give you different different kind of clinical pathophysiological mechanisms yes is this point clear so i think i am all i am completely done with the class today there is nothing else for us to learn today here so i better suggest you to come active next time okay and uh, is there uh, also again refer back to the practical slides of the abdomen okay when you learn about the practical slides of the abdomen you completely look at the ct scan okay next week i guess most probably i think i may plan for a friday's class or uh, saturday's class uh, if then we are going to start with the pathology of the intestines okay we will be dealing completely until then you guys get familiar with all the contents so that we will make it more interesting the class okay is there any doubts for today's session is there any content that you did not understand yes no okay ah uh, qu question discussion uh, when do you guys want to discuss okay i can do it in the evening if you guys want if you don't uh, you do not have any class i guess right today only radiology class right you have a class okay what about uh, okay do do all the guys wanted to do this discussion or only few people uh i'm sorry aman actually i did not record yesterday i was thinking dr mo has been recording it and yes i came to understand that dr mo's internet has been down today so uh, no we, i was unable to uh, record yesterday's class and i even don't know uh you know if he has been recording today's class as well i'm not really so sure okay actually i did not record today's class either so you do not have any class this afternoon so if you do not have any class this afternoon okay the guys who are interested uh, we can actually make down the questions discussion and we can talk with the uh, physiology and pathophysiology along with understanding the radiographic features of cardiovascular system If you guys are interested, yes, I will come down and make down time along four at four. Okay, we can take down four to six. Okay, uh, because uh, you know this is uh, Ramzan time. Uh, people will be fasting, so uh, they will be you know breaking the fast around six. So I will try to complete it before six. If you guys want to discuss, yes, uh, I will come down at four. Okay, right. uh yeah uh, people who have been sending messages about to make down this group okay 
uh, I won't be making any group. Okay, I won't be making any group. Uh, whoever are interested, whenever I am giving down a call, yes, you are welcome down to join. Okay, for the discussion sections. Okay, since uh, uh, so many people are interested to join in, so that's the reason I say that this will be the same group itself. Okay, I will not be uh, making any other group. People whoever are interested to join, yes, they are welcome to join. This is not a scheduled class. Okay, the one, the other one I am going to make is not a scheduled class. We will be discussing about the questions, answers to the previous test we have done, and then we will be dealing about uh, physiology in relation to cardiovascular system. Okay. Yes. Uh, so is four okay with everybody? Clara and other guys who also has sent me messages, right? Is four okay with you guys? Four in the sense it will be half past six in the uh, in Chinese time. Okay. Is everybody okay with that one? Great. Uh, so I guess uh, that's it for the day. Uh, then the the other session is not a class. Okay, it is not a scheduled class. It is only for because of your interest, guys. Okay. Right. So I think that is what we close it for the session now. Okay. Have a nice time. Thanks for your patience. Bye bye.